I'm Emily and I'm a journalist and I write about art and design for websites like Creative Boom and Creative Review um, and so I'm going to be chairing the panel uh, discussing the designing transformation um, aspect of DNAD today. So we've got kind of jury members from across well across the whole world and across various different disciplines as well so some of you um, were on the digital design panel, some of you were on the product design, spatial design and then um, we've also got a representative from the actual designing transformation category. So hopefully it's going to bring a lot of different insights into um, a category that I guess is quite like broad and um, abstract sounding, if you take it as a general thing. But it's been really interesting kind of looking at all the different work you've chosen, sort of seeing the scope of what designing transformation covers. Um, so I guess we can kind of go straight in and start off by, I'll introduce... Um, the people who are going to be discussing their work and then we'll kind of go and go straight into into what you've chosen um so we're going to start off with nick if that's all right yeah so nick's a designer and developer working for graphic which is a yep. design and development studio in new zealand um yes and yeah my understanding is that you kind of work mostly across it seems to me kind of cultural clients so things like architecture firms artists yeah that's like uh, it's, most of my clients seem to be other creative disciplines. So whether it's um, photographers or artists or um, <clears throat> the odd the odd kind of art gallery, but it's always um, creatives. It seems, sure. um, and I actually quite like that because it means you get to work with other creative people and you get like nice assets, nice imagery, yeah. people that care about design. Um, yeah, it's much better than, say, government work or something like that. Yeah, but also kind of more pressure because they know where you might be going right or wrong. Yeah, well. and yeah, just just dealing with um, other creative people, like being a creative person myself, I know that you know, you're quite often dealing with their, their baby, I guess, or their business. Yeah. And so it's hard to, you, like they've hired me to be bold with their, with what I'm doing for them. So it's you kind of have to trust uh, your design ability and just throw things at them and see, see what happens, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So having been on the digital panel with Ratner, yeah. it was quite striking seeing um, your choices. Like, they were very, very different, the things that you chose to talk about today. And so I guess we'll yeah. go on to Ratner after we've discussed your first choice, but your ones were very, very kind of hard hitting um, so yeah. if you want to discuss your first choice then, which is the Voices of Racism project. Yes, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, for me, the standout project um, that I, from all the projects I've been judging. Um, so Voice of Racism, it's um, kind of like a website that um, exposes everyday racism within New Zealand. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of talk in the media about this a couple of years ago that uh, various people saying that there is no racism in New Zealand or there is and there, there definitely is so um, this website kind of aims to expose that um, and so with this um, like really confronting topic it actually um, kind of exposes us in a very effective and um, simple interface so it's essentially like what you see is like a WebGL head of a person speaking you hold it you're holding down the space bar you're clicking the mouse and this here just kind of saying like, um, you know, like unconscious racism, stereotypes, microaggressions uh, towards the user with the user kind of like may not be aware that this, this stuff is actually um, an issue for some people. And so then once you hear the um, snippet of kind of voice, you're then able to dig into it to see oh, why is this racist? Why is this a microaggression? Why is this a stereotype? Um, and I just thought it was a really good way of um, kind of approaching a really um, hard topic to kind of deal with in a digital manner, but executing it in a like supreme way. Yeah. So for me, it was just, yeah, just the most engaging site that I saw, just put your headphones on, completely immersive experience, in a way you're reflecting on possibly how you've been brought up or like what you've seen in New Zealand being said to other people. It was really, really smart. And I think the way they've used like just the simplicity of, of sound and then a very, a, yeah, a very kind of clear image. It's not kind of placing 
a lot of like aesthetic decisions on something which you don't really need with it's kind of knowing where to use what if that makes sense like just prioritizing the voices yeah that's just I yeah it's just really, focusing because really i guess that's a big thing about the topic itself is people feeling like their voices aren't being heard um yeah. so i thought that was really clever kind of the way the execution um mirrored the topic itself um i just wondered when you were kind of on the panel like because obviously kind of the past year there's been um such a like renewed look at these sort of things thankfully and um i guess a lot of agencies or um education programs and that sort of thing kind of taking a long hard look at themselves and how they approach um diversity etc did you notice that there were a lot more entries kind of i guess this is open to everyone really like how did you feel about how that aspect of the last year had been represented in the work that you saw and how do you see designers like responding to things like Black Lives Matter and that sort of thing in, in whatever panels? And like, yeah, any anyone feel free to answer that. I, I was very happy to see the diverse uh, submission across the globe for the spatial design category. And that really excite me. And I do actually observe uh, a few things that, that, that sort of stood out to me. The year of 2020 has a big impact in the world. And then I also think that impacted the design community deeply. And at the same time, it seems like uh, design for social awareness and social responsibility are very evident in the submission this year. I think that we saw the, uh, an entry like, you know, um, how to deal with microaggressions and what it feels like and immersing in that in a very empathetic way in the way that Nick talked about an entry. Um, across the board though thematically, um, what we did see is this kind of um, an intense kind of um, you know pull towards like a global sensibility and that's why the themes of you know social unrest, um, racism, um, climate change, we saw a lot of, lot of uh, entries there, um, really kind of, you know, propel the world to make us feel like we are experiencing a global pandemic, uh, you know, universally. And I think that that kind of triggered a lot of creativity um, in the design community to address some really, really complex societal problems. And at the same time, what I thought was really interesting is that a lot of new technologies enabled um, things like personalization. So you have this backdrop of the things that connect us holistically um, and in what we're experiencing globally. And then you have devices that live with us that are constantly kind of balancing that with our, you know, needs in the moment um, and anticipating those through things like, you know, personalization, machine learning, AR, VR, immersing ourselves in physical uh, spaces in, at a time where we were very isolated. So I thought that that juxtaposition was really interesting to see in the work. That's a nice segue into the kind of work that you do, what you were just talking about there with sort of personalization. Yeah, we did see um, actually in the digital design another entry um, for black owned businesses. So Google had essentially seen a disproportionate, the pandemic took a disproportionate toll on black owned businesses um, and, and so in an effort to solve for that, they highlighted, and this was a controversial thing that we discussed as a panel, but they highlighted businesses so that if, if users or end users wanted to support black owned businesses, they were easier to identify on Google, Google Maps. So that was a very kind of specific way that we saw one company address it. Yeah, that is a controversial thing, isn't it? Cause it's kind of doing, it, it feels like it's, pushing and pulling at two different things which is like if you're identifying those things then you're also reinforcing a separateness aren't you so that's mm -hmm. thing. Um, maybe yeah, that's that's exactly how it's kind of split the judges like yeah. that was very um heated discussion yeah yeah for sure um maybe mark and Leia, do, do you want to just run through anything that you found particularly controversial on your panel separately perhaps let's start with mark did you find any big sticking points or anything that you particularly argued about I don't know if there was anything that controversial, but uh, there's certainly a lot of things that uh, that you could probably get emotional about. There was a lot of things uh, like was mentioned before about um, challenges in the 2020, and it's interesting that designers and creative people have to come up with uh, urgent solutions for urgent problems. So 
that makes people be extra innovative, uh, I, I find. For me, um, obviously, the, the question around the impact of all the things that happened last year um, are a little bit harder to see in the product design category. It's hard to get something done as quickly as maybe something digital, you know, where you can react really quickly to something that's happening and create something that is relevant to that theme um, because of the obviously the challenge of manufacturing and, you know, just making things in general. Product design is sometimes a little bit behind in that in that sense. One thing that I really, really noticed was the the that most a lot of projects and especially the projects that that went the furthest um, were based around social issues and social awareness. And sometimes there were some discussions around, you know, the the reason to exist for a project and and what it's actually doing and what's bringing to someone versus the what it looks like. <laughs> and you could feel that, you know, there was there was sometimes some tensions between uh, between some of us around, you know, um, uh, the aesthetics of a, of a product in, in particular versus what it actually achieves. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting, but I really, really enjoyed seeing all these like really inspiring projects um, that were really dealing with, you know, a reason to exist and, and improving people's lives. And that was that was really, really inspiring. If I may, I would like to add one thing. Uh, it's the, you know, I, I noticed this, the interesting contrast between high tech versus low tech in the spatial design during this, this particular uh, submissions. And this contrast sort of tease out the, the subjects about uh, this, this kind of spectrum of the design, which is sort of from the much more high-tech artificial engagement in a well-controlled environment versus the proactive connections, you know, the idea of meeting people where they are. So it's, it's a very interesting spectrum. That's sort of what I noticed from the spatial design. And then it, it was discussed, and, uh, but at the end is, is more of a, what is uh, the most, sort of effective and most uh, well-designed. And then that sort of become our uh, uh, sort of uh, choosing and also uh, uh, designing point. But it's very interesting to see that spectrum. There are just so many different um, things like how, how kind of good is it or how much like how effective is it? There's a lot of different, different things that you will have to go on. And I guess that's why we're talking about this stuff now. Um, so Ratna, let's, let's go on to you now, if that's okay. Um, Cause I think it would be interesting to talk about your choices in the same jury as what we've just heard from, from Nick. There were a lot of great entries in very different categories, but ultimately they all um, showed that digital design can be very transformative uh, in terms of behavior change. And, um, you know, I look at that in kind of concentric circles, right? The behavior change that we can we can do as individuals that then impact the state of society for things like racism and climate change. But I, what I also liked was the fact that when I looked at the, at the judging criteria, um, you know, how iterative design could, could also be, um, you know, introduce massive innovation like the iOS 14 updates did. And the reason I thought that they were profound was because they were actually operating on two levels. One, which is a high bar for design and quality, but, a, but a, they introduced a essential, essentially a modular um, redesigned customizable widget system um, that essentially kind of was predictive in nature and, and really, was a byproduct of how you use the device. And so what we're seeing is this kind of bi-directional feedback loop between your, you know, a user's behavior and how it uh, impacts the personalization and machine learning, um, you know, algorithms to then give you an experience that's meaningful to you in your life. And I, I found that to be you know, super interesting. And we see that as, as a massive trend in other era entries, which is really this notion of um, what things are personalized for us and what things aren't. And what is that balance um, that digital products offer? And so the other piece of it that I actually thought touches on, on kind of the larger um, topic is they also introduced, while well, they introduced, you know, a better map, um, you know, uh, 
organizing your, managing your app in new ways. Um, I think there was also definitely more intelligence, more personalization, but privacy was at the heart of it. And, and, and it was extremely controversial um, to say that we're gonna put privacy as a top priority of the user experience and expose what other apps may be tracking so that then it can offer control back to the user to say what they do and don't want apps and digital ecosystems to track. And I think that's going to have profound implications on, on how we innovate um, in, in digital design. Um, and so that's, that's really the heart of why that, that was interesting to me, because there was an interplay between um, how our data and information is treated and uh, how transparent it is to us in the user experience. People will be aware because that's the nature of, of the interface is that they get recommendations based on where they've been before and then those kind of loops. So yeah, I'd be interested to know what trends you saw coming, you know, coming from your, which is very much tuned in on that kind of personalization side of things and what, what trends you saw coming through on the digital, digital side. I, I definitely saw aspects of that. And then I saw that interplayed with things like accessibility. So how can you personalize something but still make it accessible for a large cohort of users that may have very, very different needs? And so as, as these complex systems get built um, and recommendations get provided, um, how can you offer uh, users control to manage their, their experiences? I mean, for example, um, you know, uh, the ability to, to remove something from the user interface, the, the ability to customize things. That's, that's very new in the way that, I mean, it's been, you can say, oh, you know, it's been done in the past, but now what we're seeing is a level of intelligence layered in with data. And, and I think that if we can, if we can expose that so that um, members can kind of follow along, we call them members or users, um, that's that's really, really important. Otherwise, it becomes the danger of this is it becomes a black box. And um, we don't put the humans in control of their experiences. And so I think that we're at the early stages of how all of this will evolve. But um, I think more, more innovation that balances a human need and human control over what algorithms provide us is, is, is paramount to, um, to that kind of experience. Kind of thinking about that interplay between like the human aspect and the um and i guess the sort of personalization and also kind of the way that feeds like into much broader concerns i was really interested in layers choice which was the adidas play connected project um because that seems to me to feed into both of those things and it's something that i don't feel like i've ever really seen before at least targeting that kind of audience. so would you like to talk us through your choice on that one layer yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the, the product, the project, sorry, I, I picked as a first choice is a collaboration between Adidas and um, FIFA um, has a FIFA has a, um, obviously the, the football video game has a mobile uh, version of its game, and then uh, Google checkout technology. Um, so what they've done is taking a a growing problem which is um, the kind of young generation not being active enough we're looking at a younger generation that is going to die younger than their parents will um, which is quite worrying and they've kind of I guess joined forces to try to find a solution to push um, the youth to spend more time outside and do more exercise Adidas Gamer. This unreal new product. An insult developed with Google Jetter that tracks your shot. And I think, first of all, what I thought was really interesting as an idea is that rather than, you know, saying these these kids are spending too much time playing video games they and they should stop, they've actually built onto that rather than, you know, trying to, um, I guess, make them stop playing video games. So um, they've combined this with a technology that was already existing to kind of um, encourage them to go out more. And so what they've done is they took the um, existing Google Jacket tag, which is a super small piece of um, hardware um, of electronics that contains sensors, 
Um, and I, it's, it's super small. It's I think um, they describe it as being the size of half of, the, of a pack of chewing gum. Um, so it's super small, super light. And they've created an inner sole that you put in your football shoe um, that you put that little tag inside and then just basically track movement, track speed, um, track uh, the strength of a shot and things like that. Um, and the distance you might be running. And so the way the gaming comes into play is that they, um, the users are you know, going outside, doing challenges, playing actual football um, in, the out, in the world. And by the performance that they, they achieve, they are improving their score on the game or they're improving their team and kind of earning points and rewards. Um, and yeah, the, the reason why we, we all we were really into this project and really interested into it was, so first of all, just the idea behind it, you know, being to encourage obviously um, young gamers to spend more time outside was, was quite inspiring. Um, the execution, um, we were also really impressed with, um, obviously managing to get this technology in such a small object that you can then put inside a shoe without even, you know, feeling it is quite impressive to be then able to track a foot um, as a part of the, the body rather than just a, a body when you're running or something. And um, the fact that they've ma managed to maintain that to a very low cost, um, the, the whole kit, so where you get the, the tracker, uh, the insoles and all the bits that go with it retails for 30 pounds, which is May means that it's quite accessible, which is quite, which is really, really good. And uh, you can fit it in any, any shoe. So it doesn't have to be an Adidas product. Again, opens, you know, this inclusivity and, uh, and um, kind of reaches a lot more, a lot more people. Yeah, like that project, it seemed, it seemed kind of like based off a serious concern, but making it quite fun. I'm really interested to speak to Ingrid now because I this was one of my absolute favourites, this Boards of Change project. Just kind of seeing it as an issue around politics, an issue around design, an issue around kind of society, racism. It, it seemed to kind of tie in so many things in such a simple concept. So yeah, Ingrid, I'm really interested to hear you about Boards of Change for us, please. Yes, uh, Boards of Change uh, for, for, for the risk of uh, juries that just kind of brief description. It's a project about empowering voting rights in uh, less privileged neighborhoods, especially for minority communities. And this particular project happens in Chicago, United States. And to do that, designers created a group of registered to vote booth and with plywood boards. Ironically, these boards were originally from the broken windows of storefronts uh, in Chicago. Uh, people broke the windows because they felt that they didn't have a voice. And the designer sort of repurposed these boards and then create the register to vote booth. I thought this is a very good example to share today because it sort of touched a few checklists to me. And then when I say few is actually slightly long. The first one is it responds to the urgency. And it is resourceful and creative. It's user centric. You know, it, it meet people where they are. It's portable, accessible. Although I use QR code, it's something that we consider a low tech but it's actually a perfect usage of technology in this case. It's so easy for people to just use their phone. Most importantly is that they took something that has a negative connotations and turns it into a positive proactive thing. To me, that is a good design. And from a designer's point of view, it's obvious that this is in Bauhaus, this is not Swiss design, but it's functional and meaningful, accessible, and to me, conceptually beautiful. So this sort of kind of brings up this questions about what does diversity means in the design industry? 
to me, it's important to bring diversity into the design industry, not just about designers. You know, it, it is about sort of the change in design perceptions as a whole. And then that's why I felt really strongly about this particular piece. As you mentioned, Emily, it's simple, it's accessible, and it's powerful. Yeah, you summed it up beautifully there, so thanks very much for talking us through that one. Um, Mark, I think you're the last one to talk us through. Um, so your first choice was the 2030 calculator. Um, can you talk to us why you chose that and um, yeah, what you really liked about that project, please? Yeah, I thought this was a really standout project, very um, ambitious and uh, important. Um, it's a calculator that's uh, it's called tw uh, 2030 calculator. It's, the goal is to reduce um, carbon emissions by 2030 uh, globally. So this, it's, a, it's a website and an application to help small and medium-sized companies to be able to plug in or punch in their information about their products and easily then get a label or some, some kind of uh, sticker that they can put on their products to um, inform consumers about how much uh, carbon emissions this product has and comparative to, let's say, the standard or, or most other products in that, uh, that type of product. So it's a comparative, because uh, so, it's, it's something new for most people. It doesn't really, if you, you kind of need to know how does it compare to other products. Let's say if it's a shoe, how does this compare to other kinds of shoes, the average shoe? So it gives you that sort of comparative uh, information. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, a design that can have a real impact on the world. Um, it's a new, uh, it's, it's groundbreaking because I don't think too many other companies or um, people are doing this kind of thing, not that I've, I've seen. So maybe some of the big corporations, but this is making it accessible to small and medium sized companies. And there's a free uh, subscription and you can also pay if you want more features. So it's letting people in, letting companies in and giving it a try. and um, it's also apparently open source, so it, it will then keep learning and, and get, get smarter and, and be also more comparative over time. So it's ambitious and, um, and this kind of project is exciting too, because either it can become huge and successful or it may not. So I mean, there's always a risk with innovation like this and being one of the first, uh, but hopefully it's gonna take off. So the design looks great. Uh, it's very minimalist. Uh, in, in the, the look and feel. It doesn't have a sort of environmental, maybe it might be more kind of typical environmental look that you might think. So there's no landscapes and things like that. It's very minimal and functional, which I think it's good because it gives it a sort of neutral and more of a scientific uh, feel to it. Um, and it is a calculator, they call it. So it does have a sort of uh, numbers feel. Um, but you also think you get the feeling it's, it's simply used to, which I think is important. So you don't want to be overwhelmed. Um, so it's all new stuff. So it has to be simple. But hopefully, it, um, it'll, it could one day have this sort of same function as, as you do, uh, see when you have an appliance. Uh, appliances tell you from A to D or E what kind of uh, energy they use. So Hopefully this will be the kind of thing that more and more products uh, we use uh, to help, uh, help us also make choices. Do you think that kind of Scandinavian countries are more receptive to this sort of thing? Because it does strike me as something that you, I think you have to have a willing audience to get this, this kind of product off the ground, if that makes sense. And I just wonder what you mm. kind of like the geographical reach of that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's a good question. There's definitely, um, similarities between Norway and, and Sweden. So we see that uh, I think the Scandinavian people are more are fairly receptive to that kind of thing. And like, uh, just for example, in Norway, electric cars, as you probably know, are huge here in Norway. So people are aware of uh, their carbon footprints. So I think uh, companies too, and, and the governments too, really encourage um, this kind of direction too. So I think in general, it's, uh, it's encouraged by the government and, and companies too. I think companies realize that this is important for consumers and in the end, it's good for business too. So it's a, everybody wins in the end. So, um, I would say that it's, uh, it's definitely, a, I don't know if you call it a trend, but uh, uh, Scandinavia, I think is probably leading uh, a leader in this area, I, I think. 
if I really hope it does work and it does take off and it does uh, I imagine it's the kind of project where the more people participate the more you know data there's going to be um, um, collected and how useful it's going to become but it's such a it is such an amazing tool I mean for for product design um, and especially the fact that it is like you said free as, as a free access um, that's possible um, for smaller companies it's it's a huge interest you know it's it would be amazing if, if it does take off and it does work. Um, I think we need that. We need that a lot. Um, but a lot of people have commented that in the last year, maybe climate change has been pushed to the bottom of the agenda um, because of things like the pandemic, you know, various other sort of political and social things that have gone on that hasn't felt like it's a priority. But to hear from kind of anyone that wants to talk about it, which issues they felt kind of bubbled to the surface in a genuine way, and uh, yeah, have you have you really seen sort of climate change stuff continue to be a priority for people? And that'd be anyone who wants to talk about it. There were a couple, um, so first plus 100 on that calculator, it showed up in our, um, you know, jury as well. And it definitely was was something we talked a lot about. So if, if that can change in uh, behavior in, in many industries and be ubiquitous as kind of a bar, that's huge. Um, in terms of design's value, um, the the two that that did that we did discuss um, one uh, an audience that often over gets looked, uh, which is children, and um, it was the entry was called Earth Speaker, um, and it was basically the idea was to create an EU wide movement um, through kind of with with children across continents and creating kind of a shared public space for kids' voices to be heard. So the, the idea was that these, these voices would be provided a platform for adults to listen. Um, and by using the world to give them a voice, we pushed, um, I, think, I think the team basically pushed AR and UX to create a shared empowering moment for children. And so the solution that they came up with um, and what we debated, by the way, was the execution of it. Like we, we thought it could be better, but I think the behavior that we're talking about and the social impact was what, what definitely resonated with some of the jurors. Um, and the solution was basically a multilateral artwork featuring an app and a website that was available uh, basically in official EU languages. And it, would, it created an intuitive way for kids to amplify their hopes and concerns on climate change. So it would kind of promote this cross-generational exchange across Europe and behind, uh, beyond, and then it pushed boundaries of AR. So what kids did was they um, they participated um, in like you know if you if you pull up your phone you could look at a tree and it it morphed into uh, something that became alive and talked to you. And so kids were able to have a dialogue with natural elements in the environment through technology. Um, and, and so it kind of highlighted Article 12, which was the rights of you know, children to have a voice in their environment and affect change for future generations and the future of their planet. And so basically the Museum of the United Nations um, were adopting Earth Speaker, which is called to allow kids worldwide to speak on behalf of their future and the planet. And so a lot of these inanimate objects would change and give kind of get animated so that kids could dialogue with them. And if you start that behavior that early, you can imagine these could be, you know, profound implications for people as adults to, to heal the environment. So that was one that, that came up. Just while we've got time, like one of my other projects, I guess I, I found particularly like, I feel, I feel like this has been quite a serious like set of projects. Um, I was very interested to hear Ingrid maybe tell us a bit more about um, the Just a Wall, if you can, because I thought it was a powerful one too. Yeah, this is also uh, a powerful piece to me. It's about breaking the wall of silence for abuse children uh, in, in France. And the installations is in uh, Paris, and it's using three young children, uh, I think age between five to nine. It's just such a thin wall between a child who desperately need help and grown up 
who could definitely just make a phone call or ask help or, or sort of kind of ask help for this child. So this installation basically are uh, uh, sort of put together by the team that they recreate three walls. You know, these three walls represent the three children. And this is actually a very interesting uh, sort of project to me because that the boards of change is bold, expressive, just a wall is quiet and restrained. You know, to me, that is sort of this design spectrum it's about that sometimes designers doesn't need to be at the front end of it. In this particular case, designers are much more uh, restrained and is less visible, but I really see both approaches are equally powerful. Just the way that the designer measure the children's height and then measure the wall thickness and also sort of put the things that uh, uh, sort of uh, the children's belong in at the height of their, uh, their surrounding and put them in the public space to let these walls tell the stories. You know? And to me, the process itself, the building this wall, the creating this wall is part of the design. Being on the uh, design transformation category, just quickly, um, it's pretty, it's a challenging category, I think both in terms of entry and in terms of judging, because there's so many different disciplines that get combined. It also then becomes challenging to compare things because you're not comparing the similar product, you're comparing things that are very, uh, that go across different disciplines. So, so it's, it's a interesting category. As Ingrid was just talking about, like the, the idea of the things that are behind everything it's been a real yeah real like interesting day of like looking at this stuff and learning so much about what design means in that context without sounding too cheesy um so yeah thanks everyone for talking us through it all